Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning on the top shelf. Give me a wave. Full balcony, how stunning. Well, a massive welcome again to you. If you don't know me, my name's Josh. I have the privilege of being part of the team here at Whole Vineyard. What an amazing morning it's been so far, hasn't it? Hasn't it been so beautiful, such a joy to dedicate those wonderful children and welcome them into the family. And um, what we've seen today is no small thing. I hope you realize that. Let me frame it for you a moment. Today we've had um, three families, parents, making a promise, a commitment to following Jesus with everything that they have and raising their kids to know and love Jesus, to essentially build their lives and their families around Jesus. How many of you know we we all build our lives around something, don't we? Everyone in the world. Is anyone here interested in uh, interior design? No, okay. I will swiftly move on past that point. No, um, there's a principle in interior design called the focal point of the room, and it's the thing in the room that everything is aimed at. So in a kitchen, it might be the island in a room. Uh, in, In the lounge, it might be the television. But for the guys that we dedicate their children today, the focal point of their lives and the room of their hearts is Jesus. And this is so courageous and so powerful and so world-changing in our current cultural moment that they would stand up and say, we are going wholeheartedly after Jesus in a world filled with millions of voices and pressures and narratives trying to become the focal point of their lives and families. They have stood up and said, we want Jesus to be the focal point. And not just for them, but For every single one of us, there is an invitation on the table today, which I want to unpack for a few moments. An invitation that Jesus himself would give every single one of us. And it is this invitation, come, follow me. Now, I don't know where you find yourself this morning. Maybe you're a new student here in Hull and you've grown up in a Christian family and you've got parents who... Maybe believe in God and you find yourself away from home for the very first time. Maybe you're retired and you're wondering, what does life hold for me next? Maybe you've grown up in church, you would have always called yourself a Christian, and yet right here, right now, there feels like there's something missing from life with God. Maybe you're here and you definitely wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you've been dragged along by people getting dedicated or a friend's brought you here today. Let me say you're in the right place this morning. Now, whether you believe in God or not, whether you would call yourself a Christian or not, Jesus loves you and is here for you. And he has an invitation for you this morning to say, follow me. If you've got a Bible, why don't you open up to Matthew chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, um, go to your nearest hotel room. Second drawer on the right, steal yourself a Gideon's. (laughs) It's okay if there are some glowing Bibles. Many of you have grown up that generation. But there are such things as paper Bibles. And they're unbelievable. Sorry, I've made that joke before. It gets less funny every time. Matthew chapter 4, let me read this account. Uh, It says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, Follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. This is an account of Jesus calling the first disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. And I really what I want to do today is just share four simple thoughts before we pray of what it means to follow Jesus in our world today. My reflection number one is this, and it sounds so simple. Following Jesus is following Jesus. Two things on this. Firstly, when Jesus invites people to follow him, he's inviting them to follow him. He's not inviting them to follow a religion. He's not inviting them primarily to follow a set of rules. He's inviting them to say yes to him. It's a life of walking with Jesus and a life of deep connection with Jesus and a life of love and relationship and intimacy with Jesus. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians forget that at the center of being a Christian is Christ. 
It is all about Jesus. Everything is about him. He is meant to be the focal point of our lives. Someone once put it like this. If you take Christ out of Christian, all you're left with is Ian, and Ian can't help you. (laughs) Jesus invites us to himself. He is the rock. He is our source. He is our hope. He is our comfort. He is our joy. He is our peace. He alone saves us from sin. He alone heals us from our blindness. He gives us a new name and a royal identity and invites us into a new life. Everything is about Jesus. My wife and I, Hannah, um, we have a daughter who's three and we're expecting another um, child who will be a baby boy. And um, we're really excited. But a couple of weekends ago, we had a a pretty tough weekend. Um, Friday night, Hannah noticed that the baby... Uh, wasn't moving a whole lot. So she's a little bit nervous about that. And under recommendation, the Saturday morning, um, we reached out to the to midwife. They said, come in for a check. Um, Hannah went in, and everything seemed fine in the check, but they uh, gave uh, Hannah a test to see whether her waters had broken. Apparently, it's, it's kind of a new thing, but um, relatively routine now. And anyway, the test came back positive. And Hannah's 25 weeks pregnant at the time. And so um, we kind of stepped into, in that moment, a bit of a whirlwind, like what's going on? We had the consultant and the midwife and the nurses in, and it was very much a code red environment. We didn't really know how serious it was, but 25 weeks is early. And uh, Hannah called me, and she's, she's, as you can imagine, really upset. I go into the hospital, and we have a, one of those 24 hours, which is just really tough. And we're praying a lot, and I said to um, John, when I was texting John, I said, we feel at peace but it's very emotional, and it was very, we were concerned, we had people praying for us, um, and I think we felt peace in that room because we know that the presence of Jesus is with us. In the moments when life is going really well and when life is tough, if I'm honest, I don't know where I would be without Jesus. As we're listening to the midwife explaining this is the kind of worst case scenario that you need to be prepared for, um, his presence was tangible and his peace was there. And we're able to process our emotions knowing, okay, God is with us and in control and he is always good. Um, The good news was the Sunday after that, um, Hannah had a scan and uh, they couldn't really believe it because everything seemed normal. And um, it was, yeah, everything's good. She's had a whole follow-up load of scans and everything is going really well. So praise the Lord for that. Um, Yeah, thank you. So following Jesus is about following Jesus, a person. But following Jesus is also about following Jesus. Not just believing in Jesus, not just knowing about Jesus, but it is a lifestyle transformation where Jesus becomes the focal point of the room and everything in our life is directed towards him. Jesus himself said it's not enough to believe the right stuff about me. Even demons believe that Jesus is who he is. But for the disciples following Jesus, they had to stop what they were doing and follow him. It was a full life immersion into Jesus' every day. It was walking with him and talking with him and going where he went and doing what he would do and speaking the words that he would say. And following Jesus, living like Jesus, loving people like Jesus, sharing your faith like Jesus, denying yourself like Jesus, eating with enemies like Jesus. As we follow Jesus practically, we will begin to see our lives from the inside out transformed and our city transformed as well. So Jesus says, follow me. Secondly, following Jesus is here and now. If we could have the text back up on the screen, I want to highlight two things, just the first one. Um, Jesus says, come follow me, verse 19, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, did you notice that? At once they left their nets and followed him. Next slide. Second half, Jesus calls them, follow me, and immediately, verse 22, they left their nets and their boats. Immediately, Jesus is in the here and now. He's so beautiful and so compelling and so attractive that Jesus is worth stopping whatever we're doing right here, right now, and chasing after him and whatever he's doing. Wherever you find yourself in life, there is always going to be something interesting and fun and pleasurable and distracting to pursue. But Jesus operates in the here and now. 
He's not so much worried about the past, more than what is happening right now and how we respond to him in this moment. Immediately, they followed him. Let me ask you a question this morning. What are you holding back from? What are you waiting for? Is there something or someone in your life stopping you from fully following Jesus with everything you have? Whatever it is, it isn't worth it. When Jesus says, follow me, let's follow immediately. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Don't miss out. As Christians, we get caught up, don't we, in so many different kinds of things. We get distracted by life. There are millions of voices vying for our attention and for our affection. We get caught up with questions. What if? What should I do? Who am I? We caught up with distractions, stresses and strains and the struggles of life. We allow other things to creep in and pull our attention from Jesus and they pull us from our purpose. And if we get caught up and distracted, distraction leads to drifting, doesn't it? And before we know it, we're not who we want to be. And we're not where we want to be. Uh, just we, before last, I took Ivy swimming. And um, Ivy loves swimming. She was so excited. She's just turned three. And uh, it was on a Friday, so Hannah's working. And I'm home alone uh, with the child. And um, it's great fun. And uh, we were going swimming. So I, when Hannah's not there, packing the bags is a lot more complicated. Because I just forget things and mess things up. And... We were driving, swimming about 15 minutes away, and halfway through, I remembered I've left behind um, her armbands. And if we didn't have armbands, it wouldn't be a fun swimming trip for, for me, mainly. Um, so I turned around, drove all the way back, kind of picked up the armbands. I was frantic. We've got a slot. I'm going to miss it. And then drove quickly as I could within speed limits um, <laughs> straight back to the swimming pool, Get there, we're in a changing room, we get everything Ivy sorted, she's in a Peppa Pig costume, she's got armbands, she's so excited, she just can't wait. And then I realised I've forgotten something else. I've forgotten my swimming trunks. <laughs> and I genuinely start to have a meltdown in front of my three-year-old because I don't know what to do. And... Um, I'm going to warn you, this will be too much information for some of you, especially if we've not met. But I was panicking. I didn't know what to do. And I, th I looked at Ivy. She's so excited. I, I can't. I don't know what to do. So I made the decision, rightly or wrongly, um, to go in in my pants. <laughs> Thankfully, I'd just got a brand new set of boxes, and they weren't white. <laughs> they were dark. And um, so I put a towel around my waist. Some of you are like, is this church? Um, <laughs> towel around my waist and walk out and you could put your towel there and I grabbed Ivy by the hand, towel around my waist and as quick as I could, threw the towel away, ran in the swimming pool and I said to Ivy, I gave her a pep talk, I said, Ivy, now we're in, I'm not coming out. You can do what you want, but I'm not going anywhere. And so I spent the entire time that I was there, instead of playing with Ivy, who was running around and swimming off, just floating, neck below, thinking, I hope no one looks too closely. If the lifeguard's got a good perspective, I'll get arrested. This is a disaster. And um, I was just praying, please, Lord, let no one from church come. I just, I don't want to. And then, and then maybe it's just the Lord for me telling this story. But a guy called Max Ellaby from our church walks in. <laughs> And he's, he's fully clothed, he's, he's working there, and now my heart sinks, I don't know what to do. And um, anyway, Ivy says, oh, it's time to go, Daddy, and I say, praise the Lord, and I just like rush out, embarrassingly grab the towel, put it around me, and then I go over to Max, and how are you doing, Max? And he says, yeah, I'm doing well, how are you, Josh? And I just needed to process, so I say, I'm really sorry, but um, I'm not doing that well, I forgot my swimming trunks, and I've just been in my, in my pants. And he said, yeah, I thought they looked a bit tight. <laughs> and nightmare. Anyway, why am I telling you this? Here's the point, okay? There is a point. I was so preoccupied in that moment with not being seen in my pants and thrown out of the swimming pool that I spent none of my time actually swimming with Ivy. 
I was so distracted. No, we did swim because in the deep end it was fine. But, but the point is, I was so distracted by that moment that I was missing out what was going on. And how many of you know that following Jesus begins right now? And if we're distracted by things, we will often miss out on what God is doing right now. If you've never put your trust and your faith in Christ, that, in, that invitation to come and follow Jesus is here, right here, right now. And maybe you're here today and you've been putting off doing things, putting off serving Jesus, putting off kind of making him the focal point of the room. Today is a here and now moment for you to make that response. Number three, saying yes to Jesus, following Jesus, always involves saying no to other things. As you notice, that both times when Jesus called the disciples, they left things behind. They left their nets, they left their fathers, and they followed Jesus. The nets was their, their income, their jobs. They left that behind. Their fathers, their, their relationship, their, the one who they were following as an apprentice, they left both of those things behind and followed Jesus. Jesus. Now, I would argue that to say yes to Jesus while you're saying yes to certain things which fly against the values of heaven is impossible. When we say yes to Jesus, we have to say no to other things. Otherwise, we're not actually saying yes to Jesus. Now, saying yes to Jesus and following Jesus happens in thousands of small choices that we make every single day. And those choices are often difficult. They're often costly. They may lead to people viewing you differently. They may make a situation temporarily complicated. Maybe you're at work and you'll notice that in the office people are gossiping about someone, saying things behind their back that they'd never say to their face. You have a choice in that moment. Do I engage with this? Do I stay silent? Do I, do I say, well, do you know what? I'm not sure this is the best way for us to speak here. What do we say yes to and what do we say no to? I want you to notice the things the disciples left behind. They were good things. They they were family. They were career. They weren't just bad things. But this teaches us that most of the time it's the good things that can occupy our attention and take priority over God rather than just obviously bad things. Point number four is this. Following Jesus is the doorway to destiny. As we say yes to Jesus and follow Jesus, we will be swept up into his kingdom story, into life with God, into a discovery, a journey of discovering who we are and who God is. If we could have the text back up, I want to show you one thing, just the first slide, I believe. Um, Look what Jesus offers them. He's in verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Translation I learned growing up was, I'm going to make you fishes for men. And um, the way, it's a bit weird picture, isn't it? This was always described to me as, as it kind of means we, our job as Christians is to go and catch people for Jesus and help people know Jesus. And I think that is totally true. Uh, we exist to love God and help people come home. But I think there's more to it than that. I wonder if you ever noticed that the people that Jesus was using this analogy to about fishing for people, they were themselves fishermen. Does anyone here a professional angler? No. So I don't actually think if Jesus was inviting you to follow him, um, he would use this analogy. These guys fished for a living. If Jesus were to invite you to follow him, I don't think he would say that. Why? Because you're not a professional fisherman. What he would say to you is this. If you follow me, if you follow Jesus, God wants to take your normal everyday, ordinary life, whatever you do, and breathe upon it. He wants to take you just as you are and use you to transform the world you are placed in. If you are a hairdresser, he wants you to cut hair in such a way that glorifies God and carries his presence to those that don't know Jesus. If you're a lawyer, he wants you to do law with integrity so that the values of heaven are imparted in those environments and you represent Jesus in a way that heaven invades earth. If you're a student, he wants to take your next one, two, three years at university and empower and equip you to follow him so radically and closely that everyone around you notices there's something different about you. 
You're marked with peace rather than anxiety. You're marked with integrity over compromise. And if your parents here this morning, you're raising kids, Jesus wants to breathe on that. Jesus wants to bless and fill your homes as places of his presence that are so full of him, so flourishing, so full of peace and love and health. Places of strength and fortitude that as children grow up in a pretty wild west world, They can shine like stars in the culture, as Paul says in Philippians 2. Or the message translation says this, They'll go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society, and provide people with a glimpse of good living and the living God, carrying the light-giving message into the night. That's what Jesus wants for all of us. As we say yes to following Jesus and and move after him as the the focal point of our lives, what he will do is he will breathe upon you and your life will begin to bear fruit on the inside and on the outside. My sense this morning is that Jesus has, well, it's not even a sense, I know it, but my sense is there's there's a weightiness to it, there's a There's an invitation Jesus wants to give every single one of us again. And that is, for those of you that don't know Jesus, there's an opportunity to respond and invite him into your life and actually say yes to his invitation to follow him. But there's an invitation for us as the church, for anything that's been holding back, to to lay aside the stuff that, as Paul says, clings so closely and holds on to us and entangles us so that we can run after Jesus. Amen.